IoT security. We'll have three talks addressing attacks in those areas. The first talk is given by Cesar Pereira, which has a research interest in on side channel attack and cache timing attacks, and is about cache timing attacks on RSA key generation. Cesar. Thanks for the introduction and uh, sorry for the technical problems. So this is a research done in collaboration with uh, Alejandro Cabrera, Luis Manuel Álvarez uh, from Universidad Tecnológica de La Habana in Cuba, and my supervisor, Billy Bob Bromley. So this is the contents of my presentation. Uh, I'll quickly go through introduction, uh, what it is about, and then side channel leakage finding, uh, a methodology and a tool we developed to find the flaws that we exploit in this uh, work. Uh, then we analyze the leakage and the attack that we perform, and finally we conclude with some lessons learned. So for the introduction, so what we did is a single trace cache timing attack on the binary extended Euclidean algorithm or GCD uh, during RSA key generation. So by ex targeting this algorithm, we managed to recover RSA private keys uh, using a single trace, which was uh, a bit uh, complicated. Uh, why did we manage, uh, why did we target this? Sorry, uh, our motivation was cloud services uh, in where users are co-located, so one user can spy on the other. Uh, it's getting more common and common. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, Let's Encrypt that makes RSA key generation a semi-predictable operation. Um, in addition to that, microarchitecture attacks have been quite uh, common lately. Uh, after Meltdown and Spectre, there's been a lot of uh, research into this field. And additionally, RSA key generation has been neglected on the software side. So on the uh, hardware side, has been protected and there's been a lot of research in that area. But on the software side, it always been assumed that it's uh, not vulnerable, uh, mainly because you only have one chance to capture a trace. So the key is generated only once and never again. After that, you can use the key, but during the generation, it only happens once. Uh, and how did we do this? So we developed a new methodology to help us uh, detect insecure code paths in OpenSSL. And then during the attack, we use a flush and reload uh, technique, uh, which might be known for some of you. Uh, then we borrow some signal processing techniques from physical side channels and perform a lattice attack to recover the private keys. Okay, so now about the leakage finding. Before I talk about the leakage finding, I have to talk about the uh, BN flag constant time that is used in OpenSSL. So OpenSSL relies on this flag to protect against timing attacks. The way this flag works is uh, it is set on B BN big numbers, and every time that some computation needs to be done on these big numbers, which can be um, scalars or nonces or private values, uh, the function checks. At the top of the function, there's a check to see if it's set. And if it's set, it takes an early exit to a different version of the same function that it's constant time. And if it's not set, then it continues performing a variable time version of the function. This is done uh, because OpenSSL uh, prioritizes uh, performance than security uh, because they assume that most of the operations are uh, public key operations. So we only need to mark the cases where a private information is used. Unfortunately, this uh, flag gives a lot of room for mistakes because programmers need to know how it works 
and where exactly they need to put this flag. And as a proof of that, there's been several flaws uh, that have been exploited because of the mismanagement of this flag. Either they forgot to set it, or they set it on the wrong uh, uh, big num. So it's been a, a, a big issue in OpenSSL. And so we decided to take all this information from these CVEs and the research that has been done. And then we thought, okay, what can we do with this? We came up with a new methodology that it allows us to check for flaws in OpenSSL. So what we do is we take this list of uh, vulnerabilities that are known and we use a debugger. And the debugger, uh, we program it to automa automatically set breakpoints to lines of code that should be unreachable. That this means after the early exits, we put breakpoints there. So we can see if they continue with the variable time execution or not. And once that we have the debugger, the debugger and then we have the breakpoints, we run several security critical uh, operations uh, such as RSA key generation, encryption, uh, digital signing. And if any of these uh, breakpoints uh, is reached, then we generate a report of that. Uh, after the report is generated, we can manually investigate the root cause of that. Sometimes there might be false positives, uh, but every now and then, then we get the uh, real vulnerabilities like in this case. So for that, we developed a tool um, that takes the binary, in this case OpenSSL, and takes a file with all the triggers, the points of interest that we are interested, and the function that we run, in this case it's uh, RSA key generation uh, using OpenSSL. As you can see from the image, uh, we have three insecure code paths. So we have one in the modular exponentiation that happens during the Mont Montgomery uh, setup. We have a call to the GCD function. And then we have a modular, insecure modular inversion um, during the Miller-Rabin primality test. So out of these three, we decided to attack the BN GCD function because it was the one that was leaking the most information and it was easier to, to attack. Uh, on a side note, the tool was expanded and it was transformed into a continuous integration tool that is called TriggerFlow by some people from, from our research group. Uh, you can go and check it out in there. Uh, it's a really nice tool. Okay, so once that we found the flaws, we have to check into them where is exactly the, fault, uh, the, the flaws or the leakage happening. So for that, we went to the OpenSSL RSA key generation algorithm. And in there, we checked that um, when it generating the, after generating the prime values, either P or Q, it performs a GCD computation on P minus one and Q minus one and the public exponent E which in OpenSSL, it defaults to, to, the, to, to the 16 uh, plus one. Uh, and then checks the coprimality between the prime minus one and the public exponent. And if it's coprime, then it proceeds with the computation of the rest, rest of the parameters. If it's uh, not coprime, then it generates a new prime value and repeats the test. So this GCD computation is done uh, using a variable time algorithm, which is the one that we exploited. Uh, the rest of the parameters, they don't uh, matter for our attack. They are just for completeness. Now the binary GCD, uh, it's very dependent on its inputs. Uh, I'm not going to explain all of it, but some important things to say is that we can track uh, two uh, pieces of code in here, two blocks of code. So we can track the U loop or D loop in one 
side and in the other side we can track the sub step. So these run interchangeably uh, between the two input values. Uh, but uh, interestingly, during Eroseki generation, what happens is that the input values, one is uh, the public exponent E, which is 16 bit value, and the other one is the prime value, which is 1024 bits. So that means that for the very, let's say, 1000 iterations, it runs only on the prime value. It only reduces the prime value, and then when they're about the same size, they start to run interchangeably, the public exponent and the rest of the prime value. So after considering that, we know that uh, we can just track the sequence of uh, right shifts or divisions by two on the U-loop, V-loop, and the subtractions that happen uh, down there. So if we can track that sequence of operations, we can reverse back and get uh, the bits from the prime value. And according to the work by Coppersmith, uh, we, we know that if we know at least half of the prime value, we can factorize n and recover the, public, the private key. So that's in theory, of course. In practice, it was a little bit more difficult. Uh, okay, so quickly, just a reminder for those who are not familiar. Uh, we have cache timing attacks because the computer, the memory hierarchy um, depends on how close they are to the CPU. So registers and caches are really fast compared to RAM and main memory. And even the caches, like the first level cache, second level cache are faster than third level cache. So this difference in time, uh, they make possible to perform cache timing attacks. Uh, and there are different techniques to perform cache timing attacks. In this work, we use uh, what is called flush and reload by Yuval Yaram and, and Faulkner. And basically, this is how it works. So the victim executes its own process, filling the cache, and then the attacker flushes the cache, the same cache line. Uh, and then the victim may or may not access that uh, piece of, of code or that cache line during the waiting period. And then after some waiting period, the attacker reloads the data. And if the data is there, then it's going to be a fast reload. If it's not, then it has to go and fetch it from main memory, and it's going to take more time. So all these variations in time uh, m make possible a cache timing attack. And on the other hand, the performance degradation attack is basically just what it's a step two in there. The attacker can just, uh, in a loop, continuously flush certain memory addresses, which are used uh, continuously by the victim. So it's effectively slowing down the execution of the victim. OK, so after saying that, uh, the attack scenario is like this. We have a victim in one core. We have a flush and reload attacker in another core and a performance degradation attacker in a third core. And they all, all share OpenSSL. Uh, share is, uh, OpenSSL is uh, compiled as a shared library. So they all have access to the same code. And after that, uh, basically we have a huge trace that is, looks similar to what you see on the top. Uh, from there, we create some templates. And we use the templates to run the Pearson correlation to find the specific parts that we want in these huge traces. Once that we have the parts that we're interested in, we run a low pass filter and perform horizontal analysis to recover a sequence of operations uh, similar to what it looks uh, on the bottom. So the L's represent uh, right shifts and the S's represent subtractions. So we always have at least one subtraction, at least one shift between subtractions. 
Uh, after we have the sequence of operations, we need to convert that to a sequence of bits. So for that, we use and improve the expand and cron algorithm, which uh, correct the errors on the sequence of operations. And in general, it works that it uh, creates candidates uh, in a tree, like it, it, it shows in there, and then it starts uh, creating more and more candidates that fulfill certain rules. The ones that do not fulfill these rules, they get prone. And at the end, we end up with a list of candidates of uh, the, pros the possible prime value. This list, it gets uh, ranked, and the, it is put into a lattice problem. We put the lattice, well, we create several instances of the lattice problem, and we put them in a uh, cluster, and the cluster runs for four hours. We let it run for four hours. Uh, this is chosen arbitrarily um, because it represents a good time an attacker can wait four hours. And after those four hours, uh, the success rate was 27%. We did this for 10,000 traces, and the success rate was around 27%. OK, so. So that was the, the attack. Uh, after that, oh, a summary. So we developed the methodology. We used this methodology and the tool to uh, found flaws in OpenSSL. After we found some flaws, uh, we went there, we investigate the leakage. Uh, the leakage was in GCD algorithm. And then we explored the GCD algorithm with a flush and reload attack. We use signal processing techniques, error correction algorithms, and lattices to recover the private keys with a success rate of 27%. After this, uh, we perform disclo responsible disclosure with OpenSSL. Uh, they assign a CVE to our work, and they confirm that all 110 and 102 branches uh, were affected. At the time of the disclosure, OpenSSL 111, which is the latest version, did not exist. And they took our patches. So it's fixed now. It's been fixed for, for some time already. And two important lessons to take from, from our work is that we need to take a secure by default approach. I think uh, security libraries should take this, this approach. Some of them do, some of them they don't. But I think in general, we should strive for that. And we should adopt constant time algorithms, like uh, the one presented two days ago, the GCD in constant time. And also, we should make sure that the knowledge is transferred. So chess is a nice uh, conference because we have engineers, we have cryptographers, industry, academia together. But it's not always the case. So sometimes that uh, makes not doesn't make possible for the results from academy to per permeate to the real world. So we need to find this midpoint and make sure that the security is well implemented. And after that, well, thank you for listening. And I take questions. Questions for Cesar. question I do have one quick question can yes. you go back on slide eight sorry can you go back on slide eight eight yes yes you spend a bit more time on how do you select the, the point of interest ah, okay so to select the point of interest that we use the information that we gather from all these CVEs so in the CVEs there uh, we went to the code in OpenSSL and we saw where the flow was. And then in most of the cases, the flow was because of the, the flag was not set. That meant that the secret operations didn't take the early exits to the constant time versions. 
So in many cases, what we did is just chose the points of interest as soon as the check was done. So if the check wasn't, was not successful and it didn't jump, then it will continue to, to perform the, this non-constant time function. And that's how we chose most of the, of the points of interest. Any other question for Caesar? If not, let's thank Caesar again. Thanks.